We have these, this technological advance where the tools for measuring and actually stimulating the brain are just unbelievable Star Wars like uh, possibilities and so meetings like this are really exciting because um, people in person are able to get together and kind of share um, what they've learned, uh, how it's working um, and all of this is being used to better understand how the brain's working but in addition some great new therapies are coming out of it and uh, you can sense the promise of not only where we are but what's going to be in the next future and uh, it's just really exciting. You can quickly show them some of the non-invasive approaches that we have like TMS or TDCS and uh, and just uh, remind them that what we're doing is just actually what the brain does all the time naturally and we're just uh, kind of coming in and, and moving it differently and um, and so in terms of patients most patients with the disease are absolutely fine with idea of brain stimulation just like the idea of wearing a cast or using a crutch so um, patients are much more in general receptive to it once you kind of show them how it might be able to help their specific disease. The general public, it's a little scary but then uh, you know the brain is the most exciting frontier we have and the ability to be able to get in and test and change is, is, um, is good. Well, so I've been an advocate of the field for almost 30 years now um, and uh, it was really an afterthought. There was you know, there was neurosurgery, there was ECT, there was some threads of brain stimulation. Um, and then with, um, with deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's disease and TMS for depression, we have some real breakthrough therapies. And so it's expanded. And I, I don't know how big it's going to get. Um, the journal that I edit called Brain Stimulation, uh, one way to kind of measure a journal is to look at what's called the impact factor. The impact factor for that journal is now nine. The impact factor for the, the best neuropsychopharmacology journal, the journal that handles Prozac and all the drugs and everything, it is, is only seven or eight. And so we've already eclipsed in some ways uh, the dominant way of treating the brain in terms of medication, just in terms of the science that's happening. Uh, will brain stimulation be as common as Prozac uh, and will it be the most uh, the default way of actually treating brain diseases I actually think that's true now when will that happen will it be in my lifetime will it be five years I don't know but I can certainly see that that's the direction that we're heading and it's just so exciting as we get ever better treatments and modalities to kind of see that starting to happen I'm a researcher, but I'm also a medical doctor, a psychiatrist, and I see patients. And uh, I, uh, we have TMS and ECT clinics uh, all around. We're in Charleston, my hometown, and, and I work at the VA. So I see patients commonly every day, and, uh, and then I see the staff who treat these patients. And uh, it's just wonderful to see. Not everybody gets better, uh, but, you know, easily 30 to 60 percent will get what's called remission that is their depression temporarily just goes fully away and um, those are great stories those are really great stories and I uh, and that happens almost every day now and uh, then there are patients whose lives we've we've uh, we've changed and um, and it's very gratifying because because almost everybody that that I see that is now getting brain stimulation has tried and failed multiple multiple medications so the medicines haven't really worked for them and uh, so and depression the disease that I work with the most does make people hope less so they actually give up on life and give up on themselves and so the, being able to get rid of the depression get rid of the hopelessness get them back in the game give them hope about their life uh, is very very gratifying well for me the AHA movement was back in 1989 uh, during my first research fellowship I was in London um, learning how to do PET scanning so a way of imaging the brain back then that was the only way we could look at the function of the brain and I was over in London learning how to do it and I was in a research hospital and um, 
uh, and I was in an elevator and a patient a subject in a study was in the elevator with me and he said doc you won't believe but up there a, a man put a, a researcher put a magnet on my head and made my thumb twitch and I said really what floor was that he said six and so we rode down to the bottom he got off and then I punched six and uh, I went up and I walked into the lab of John Rothwell who's here and we're, we're actually celebrating his retirement at this meeting but John was there working on the motor system putting it over the motor area making the thumb twitch with TMS and um, and I remember I was just starting to understand the the neuroanatomy of depression and the prefrontal cortex regulating deeper emotional areas and I I remember at that moment I said I had the idea well maybe we could use stimulation not causing a seizure like ECT but just subconvulsive repeated stimulation to rehabilitate that this network that I suspected was was wrong and was causing depression and um, and I remember asking him I said John no I didn't know him, Professor Wathwell, uh what would happen if you just moved that forward and he looked up and said um, I don't know uh, why would you ever want to and so uh, for me, that was the aha moment that made me spend my career ask, you know, answering the question, why would you ever, well, you'd want to, so you could understand this part of the brain and then treat depression. Uh, right, so that was my aha moment. And then the first patient that we were able to do wasn't in London. I wasn't, wasn't able to do clinical work until I moved to the NIH in Bethesda. And then I had the first patient that we, had who was treatment resistant had been ill for four or five years and then we gave her TMS and she got better and it was like oh my gosh if I'm um, can I be so lucky as to have stumbled onto something that might work and it does neuroscience is advancing we're learning so much about how the brain works and is organized and technology is advancing ways to get into and stimulate the brain and then catalog what's happening and then feedback information is there so the technology is just way outstripping uh, the rate limiting step and the rate limiting step are people like me um, clinicians who treat the diseases who also understand the new technologies and then can apply them and test and say this works this doesn't work and we don't have enough of those kinds of people. Uh, the way our world is structured, there's not really a pipeline to, to grow those. And so what we've got is, a, right now, <laughs> we have almost a supply chain issue where we have so many new technologies and new ideas, but we, we need to get them through clinical trials to test. And we don't have enough people who know how to do clinical trials. And so if there are people who are getting clinically trained out there, um, uh, think about doing research uh, and if there are researchers think about getting some clinical training so that we can we can come together to do this body work because that's the only way that we're going to get a lot of these new technologies out to market.